Christmas, Easter, Confirmation, Ordination, Marriage, New Baby, Baptism and Birthday, Valentine's, Housewarmings, Celebrations, Graduation, Any Occasion, No Occasion, On Vacation or Consolation. Ad Crucem has all your gift giving covered. Gifts for yourself, gifts for your spouse, gifts for your godchild or your pastor. Buy from us and advert a disaster. Visit adcrucem.com. That's A D C R U C E M.com. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge Podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Right now I'm sitting at my desk looking out over a field of snow and it's amazing. We're recording from home Hmm. because there was a big snowstorm in St. Louis in the last couple of days. And I'm very happy that it's because of snow and not because of COVID that we're all back to our home office recording studios. So today is a Storytime with Sarah episode. I'm pretty excited about this one. This episode is actually inspired by a Facebook post I saw several months ago from the memorial service for Amanda Husberg. Now, Amanda is someone that I had never really heard about. She has a few things that we may be familiar with, but somebody that I was not familiar with her name at all. She is a modern Lutheran lady hymn writer And she is definitely somebody to know about. She Mm. has a very interesting story. I want to give a huge thanks and a shout out to Reverend Dr. John Nunez and Dr. Barry Bob for sharing their time with me to tell me her story because she just passed away a year ago and her entry in the companion to the Lutheran service book is pretty short. And I was like, you know what? I need to go to some first first sources on this. Hmm. So I reached out to both of them and they were gracious enough to actually have a conversation with me about Amanda's life and her work. Super cool of them to do. I'm very thankful for that. I got some personal stories too, which is kind of fun. And (laughs) also (laughs) they are working on a documentary about Amanda and her life and her work, which should be dropping around the same time as this episode, all around the date of her death. So hopefully we'll be able to also link that in the show notes for this episode episode so you can watch their documentary that they've, they're they working on at the same time that I was working on writing the notes for this episode. So really cool stuff. We're going we're gonna to celebrate Amanda's life and work today. And always, if you don't have the companion to the Lutheran service book, you should totally go get one. I didn't get a ton of my notes from there for this one. However, you won't regret it. If you love knowing stories behind the hymns and the stories behind the people who write the hymns and their life and work and how the Lutheran world of hymn writers is all connected in a very weird way, you should totally get it. You won't regret it. So, Amanda Husberg. Amanda was born on December 7th, 1940 in Chicago, Illinois. She was the oldest of three kids with two younger brothers, Robert and William. She and her family were members of St. Luke Lutheran Church on West Belmont Avenue in Chicago, where Reverend Kretzman was pastor. She sang in the choir. She took piano lessons, went to Lutheran High North in Chicago, a pretty traditional Midwest Lutheran upbringing in the 40s and 50s. Pretty standard stuff. Except she was born one year to the day before Pearl Harbor. Correct. Her first yes. birthday Whoa. was interrupted was by that. And that mm. was probably every year that she was alive. She had to be aware mm-hmm. that that was, that was her birthday. Mm. Rough. So mostly yeah. traditional. Mostly yes. traditional. But yes, she would have had very formative years during the Second World War. So, hmm, hmm. So she ended up going to Concordia Teachers College in Seward, Nebraska, and graduated from there in 1962 with a bachelor's in education. She also studied organ performance with Jan Bender. So pretty high caliber Lutheran organist to be learning organ performance from. She then went on to study early childhood education at Hunter College in New York City, and she graduated from there with a master's degree in early childhood education in 1971. So after she graduated from Hunter College, she began teaching elementary school at Redeemer Lutheran School in Westfield, New York, 
from 1962 to 1964. And then in 1964, she began her lifelong tenure at St. John the Evangelist Lutheran Church in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, New York. So she is a Chicago transplant to the East Coast, Mm. and she ends up spending the rest of her career and her life in Brooklyn, New York, which I think is really cool. Mm. So she would continue to serve St. John until her death on February 15th, 2021. So just a year ago. Wow. At the same time, she was also director in one of the 450 New York City publicly funded daycare centers. So she had a side gig and she continually taught children throughout her entire time as well. Mm-hmm. She would actually go on to teach for 36 years in Brooklyn and Queens daycare centers, which was at least, if not all, in part because St. John couldn't actually afford to pay her a living wage. So she found her own way to make ends meet and to be able to serve the church. But even in this, she was able to influence the lives of young people. And while she was at these daycare centers, she was actually pioneering a pedagogy, including music in early childhood education, which was kind of unheard of at that time. She was on the cutting edge of bringing early childhood education to these publicly funded daycare centers in New York City. I mean, that that in itself is a huge legacy for yeah. all of these kids in New York City. Maybe music education. What did I say? Early childhood education. Yes, I meant music <laughs> education. <laughs> I was like, they're not practicing early childhood. Just, what are they doing in these schools? <laughs> Music education in early childhood care centers. Yes, thank you. No, you're fine. I just was like. <laughs> Sometimes my my mouth starts saying things, but my brain doesn't actually know it's happening. So cheers, cool. sis. Been there, done that. <laughs> this is just the beginning of her story, though. So I want to give you a little bit of a background of St. John the Evangelist. And the history, a little bit of the history of the congregation and the neighborhood where she served, because this plays a huge role in her music and in her legacy of being there for so long. So St. John is located in Williamsburg, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn. That is where A Tree Grows in Brooklyn is set. Is it really? Book club ladies out there who uh, (laughs) love this novel as much as I do, Betty Smith's A Tree Grows in Brooklyn is set in Williamsburg. So I feel like I I know the the neighborhood. Go read that book if you haven't. That's amazing. I did not know that. So it's bordered by, if you know the area, it's bordered by Greenpoint on the north, Bedford Stuyvesant to the south, Bushwick and East Williamsburg to the east, and the East River to the west. So that's kind of where it's set in Brooklyn. As of the 2020 census, the neighborhood's population was 151,000-ish. So a lot of people in in the area. And in the 1950s, so this would have been right before her time there. But if you think about the 1950s in American urban centers and all of the cultural things that were happening in the U.S. in the 1950s, it was a time of, quote unquote, white flight out of cities. um, And that affected St. John and Williamsburg. And the congregation of St. John actually made the intentional decision to stay put in the community because they could have moved out of the community. But they decided at that point to be intentional about where they were in the city and to be a place for the people that were still uh, surrounding them. And this is actually the time that they added evangelist to their name to become St. John the Evangelist because they wanted the message to be clear to the community around them that they were going to be a place of outreach into the surrounding community. And that decision to stay there has had a quite a, a ripple effect in a really wonderful way hmm. uh, that the word of God is still faithfully preached in the midst of the community that's there. I think that's pretty cool. So over the nearly 60 years that Amanda lived there, the neighborhood underwent a lot of transition, which also not a very uncommon thing for an, an urban city center. When she began there in the what, early 60s, Williamsburg was incredibly poor African-American community. Um, the neighborhood had a lot of troubles that urban communities face a lot of violence, dysfunction, socioeconomic challenges. Um, And then through the 60s and 70s, the neighborhood became a lot more diversified with Latinos, a lot of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, other Spanish-speaking people. And St. John is actually located directly across from a public housing project. Mm. So that's actually where a lot of their members were coming from. So that gives you a bit of an idea of the community where they were, the the people that were a member at St. John. Was it a pretty diverse congregation then? Or did it start yes. out as predominantly white and then... 
I'm sure before the 50s, it, it probably was. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a very diverse congregation. And even now it's it's multicultural okay. people of all all different types of backgrounds, socioeconomic, everything. It's kind of a melting pot of the church. So it, at that time, uh, the Reverend Richard Newhouse was pastor, hey. and you might be familiar <laughs> with his name. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Rachel's familiar with his name. <laughs> he served there from 1961 to 1977. And if you don't know that name, he was a very dynamic pastor. He was known for being a voice for public square issues. Yeah, he started out LCMS, then became he started out LCMS. LCA, and finally ended up in the Roman Catholic Church. So, he's, But along the way, he founded the Lutheran Forum magazine, and then also some of our conservative readers out there will know the name First Things. The First Things magazine and intellectual community was his brainchild. So, yes. yes, very, very famous pastor type is the Reverend Richard John Newhouse. How do you go from ELCA to Roman Catholic? He's a very interesting, yeah. he holds a lot of interesting views. I think I was reading like a piece that Time did about him. He he described himself as politically liberal, but theologically very conservative. Mm-hmm. It's hmm. it's very interesting. I so I don't I won't talk a whole lot about no, him because this, this is not isn't about, about him. This isn't about but, him. He's not a Lutheran lady. Right. No, he's not. But that gives you I mean, he was there when she started. And uh, so from 1961 to 1977. So that was a long time for him to be pastor and her to be the music director. So they worked very closely together. This is a church where things are happening, basically. Yes. Yes. Yep. And those were very formative years for her and just her personality of being involved in all of this and just the location of where the church was and all of the cultural and political things that were happening during this time. There was just there was a lot going on. So we've talked about all of the things that were happening during this time. Civil rights movement Mm -hmm. was huge at this point of Vietnam War. The abortion debate leading to Roe v. Wade, Pastor Richard John Newhouse, he was vocal about all of them, and she would have been right there in the thick of it as well. So all of those things happening all at once. Amanda was very deeply invested in the community where she was. She lived among the people she served at St. John's. So she purchased a home in the community, Hmm. and she watched the community gentrify around her as she was there for nearly 60 years. So her home ended up actually being worth an insane amount more than when she bought it because of all that gentrification. So the community continued to to shift and to change. More black, white, Latino, upper socioeconomic class folks were moving into the community and began to develop it. So it becomes this highly mixed community across all of these ethnicity, education, economic um, stra- stra- stratuses, stratus layers, strata. People. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but music, as we know, is this universal language. And Amanda knew that. And she knew the power of music and the gospel to bring people together. So she had this gift to bridge the divides between people of different backgrounds, um, to bring them all together around God's gifts to us. And that is that is the legacy that still lives on at St. John. So you can see Amanda cared deeply for the people she served. She immersed herself in the sights and the sounds of the cultures that surrounded her. So there was a lot of of jazz and gospel elements Mm -hmm. that were happening in this community. The blue notes and the chordal structures and rhythms that were prevalent in the the music from all these different cultures that, that were right there. And so she actually was incorporating those elements into her music. So she obviously came from a, you know, German Lutheran taught background going from a Lutheran church in Chicago and being taught at Concordia Teachers College and then coming into this community that is almost the exact opposite of that and being able to kind of meld all of that together and to keep this historic Lutheran liturgy, but bringing in these musical elements that really spoke to the people that were there. So is she both a hymn writer and a hymn composer? She writes some text, but she's primarily music. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. So all of this is is really prevalent in her Brooklyn Mass. She wrote this Mass for her church, and it's infused with the feel of the community around the congregation. And I'm hoping we can put a link to that in the show notes. You can't find it on YouTube. I'm really hoping we can find a recording of this so you can hear the blue notes and the the, the feel that she had. But it's still a recognizable Lutheran liturgy, which is huh. it's a, it's a skill. 
she wanted this historic liturgy, historic Lutheran liturgy, to resonate with the people who were coming to receive God's gifts of word and sacrament, and she was really able to put it in the language of the people. She was doing these things well before they were present in our hymnals. So if you look in our hymnal, she has two hymn tunes and then a couple settings of Spanish language pieces. But mm. this is all now. So in the, what, 60s, that's even pre, pre-LW. pre So these would be TLH. This is TLH era of, of Lutheran hymnal and worship. And she's starting to pull in all of these elements to, to bring in a cultural feel for these people. So she was this pioneer of creating music for the church to sing. And because Amanda served for so long in this congregation, nearly 60 years, she served as this anchor for the congregation, steadfastly serving there through multiple pastors who served there over the years. And not many people stay in one place for close to 60 years. So that in itself is Especially quite in a an legacy. urban center like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, yeah. I can't stay in a place for 60 months. <laughs> <laughs> Still working on 60 weeks. We'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Especially in a place that, that sees so much change. So you can imagine all of the lives that she was able to reach with all of this music of the faith, especially all of the children's choirs at St. John's. Everyone in the community loved her because of her attention to children and the children's choirs. And she had a background in early childhood education, so she obviously cared a lot for the kids around her and the kids in the congregation, wanting them to have this foundation in the music of the church in order to grow up and be musicians in their churches, which I think is super important. You know, she was raising up the next generation of, of church members of the body of Christ, and that, that is quite a legacy. So Amanda has nearly 300 hymn tunes published in the U.S., Canada, Brazil, China, and the U.K. That is a lot. That's a lot. Uh-huh. Across a variety of denominations in hymnals and hymnal supplements. We have some in our Lutheran service book across other Lutheran denominations in the U.S., other Catholic, I think Catholic hymnals, Methodists, I mean, everywhere. You can find her tunes everywhere. Her most popular tune is called Jennings Houston, which is named after people she knows. And it's in at least seven different hymnals under the, the text, God the Sculptor of the Mountains. This isn't in our LCMS hymnals, but it is in the ELCA hymnal and also This Far by Faith, which is the really cool African-American hymnal put together by the LCMS and the ELCA published by Augsburg. So you can check it out in there too. She has two liturgical masses for St. John. I mentioned the Brooklyn Mass, and she has another one as well. She has several choral pieces in print, including I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, which you can find at CPH, and I Lift My Eyes to See, which is a text of Stephen Starkey. There's a Stephen Starkey-Amanda Husberg collaboration. Super cool. Published by CPH also. She also has a book of 47 of her own hymn tunes with new texts, eight of which are her own. So she did write a few texts for that one. And that's titled When You Pass Through the Waters, published by Wayne Leupold Editions. And then a large choral work called The Feast Prepared a Requiem with a text by Richard Leach, published by CPH in 2012. That one is a pretty popular one. You can find that one and listen to it on CPH. It's pretty cool. She also composed The Concordia Psalter, which is three sets of musical settings of psalm paraphrases, also by Richard Leach. And now, Richard Leach is a name that I'm not familiar with either, but he had a huge influence over Amanda, and they did a ton of work together. Mm. And so this all started at a workshop at St. Olaf College in 1995, where she met Richard Leach, who is a hymn writer from Connecticut, and whose work she dearly loved. So they collaborated on several things, including Come and Hear the Blessing, New Hymns and Songs on the Beatitudes, which is published by Abington Press. He wrote the text, she wrote the music, and she is quoted to have said, his poetry is so full of music that the music almost writes itself. Oh, I would love to have someone say that about me someday. Right? Mm. I should probably write poetry. Yeah. I love that two East Coast Lutherans, like musicians, (laughs) met at this small university in Minnesota. <laughs> like they were both East Coast people and they had to go to Minnesota to properly connect. But it's uh, in all of yeah, small I school, know. big choir. <laughs> right. I know. Right. <laughs> so at this workshop at St. Olaf College, 
she also met the wonderful, sainted Carl Schulk. Mm. Uh (laughs) Who encouraged her talent for preserving the tone of the text in the music. He told her that her melodies were very strong, but her harmonies underneath could be a little stronger. So he actually mentored her for years after that workshop. And you can kind of see this mentorship in her music with the quality of the singing melodies and these beautiful harmonies underneath. And if you're familiar with any of Carl Schalk's work. He just writes stuff that it almost sings itself. It's so, it's simple, but it's not simple in a bad way. It's simple in this way that that you can, you just, you can sing it so freely and it's, it's just wonderful stuff. So you can see his influence in a lot of her work. So she collaborated with Richard Leach and Carl Schalk. She also collaborated with Lutheran hymn writer Gracia Grindahl, for the works A Treasury of Faith Lectionary Hymns New Testament Series B and A Treasury of Faith Lectionary Hymns Old Testament Series C, both published by Wayne Leupold Editions. Gracia wrote the text, Amanda wrote the music. These are, this is hundreds, hundreds of hymns in these books. So she was, she was just like knocking out stuff, but she had this love of writing accessible music that connects to our lectionary and to the, these historic roots in the church. I think that's one of the things I love most about her story is that she's not making stuff up. She's connecting these lectionaries and the historic liturgy and all of these things that are historic parts of our church. And she's writing all of this new music for them in a celebration of this lectionary and the music that we have in our church. I think it's that's just really cool. So she had a, a an interesting way of composing music. She would actually come up with these tunes by having the text first, and then she would just speak it over and over and over and over until the tune would like come to her. Huh. So it was this this interesting way of composing, and that's also why they sing the way they do. If you look at the two hymns she has in her hymnal. I heard the voice of Jesus say, which is Lutheran Service Book 699, and Heavenly Hosts in Ceaseless Worship, which is Lutheran Service Book 949. They both kind of sing that way. They they sing the way you would speak them, but in this beautiful and glorious way. It's it's a very interesting thing. And I mentioned that the tune Jennings Houston was named after somebody she knew. That was kind of her thing. She would name her tunes, not always, but a lot of times she would name her tunes for people that she knew in her congregation or that she worked with. So she had this personal connection of like pulling people into her music by, you know, commemorating them in her in her tune names. Um, One of them is named Jones after Jackie Browning Jones, who she met at a conference. So just finding ways to connect people to the music and to pull them into it. So she had this deep passion for putting these biblical texts to music. She loved the liturgy and hymnody, and her life's work was really making music of the church accessible to people while staying true to our Lutheran identity in worship. So in addition to those two hymn tunes, I heard the voice of Jesus say, and Heavenly Host and Ceaseless Worship, we also have settings for LSB 723, El Señor Es Mi Luz, and 958-959, Padre Nuestro, which is... Our Father, in the Lutheran service book. And that also reflects her work with multicultural Lutheran hymnody. Can I just say as a testimony of the the accessibility of her hymns, as soon as you said and the names of the hymns that are in LSB, I could hear them. Right. Because, and that's, these aren't hymns that I sing all the time. It's not like they show up and it's not like they're Amazing Grace or Just As I Am. Mm-hmm. These are hymns right. that I've sung a couple of times. And then Mm -hmm. you say, I heard the voice of Jesus say, and all of a sudden I just hear the melody line in my head. I don't know any of the words, but the entire tune comes like rippling through my brain. And I think that really is that that shows that she did exactly what she set out to do. Yeah, her her talent of just marrying the two. So they're they just become this one thing that, yeah, like you said, it's it's great. And (laughs) These hymn tunes have been stuck in my head for like a week because I've been writing these notes. It's every morning I'm like, oh, look, it's a new Amanda Husberg tune in my head. That's cool. <laughs> Total earworms. <laughs> that we can't, not complaining. We can't sing on air like we would like to because they're not in the public domain yet. <laughs> I know, right? Someday, someday. <laughs> 
So not only was she well loved just in her in her own community um, among the people that she served, but she was also very highly recognized in the hymn writing and church music community at large. She was a lifelong member of the Hymn Society in the U.S. and Canada, and she was a frequent presenter for them. She was also a member of the American Composers Forum, the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians, and ASCAP. And because she had contributed so much to congregational singing and teaching the faith through song, the Atlantic District of the LCMS conferred on her the Servant of Christ Award on June 10th, 2000. It's a huge award for her to get. So her influence was so widespread with people all across all denominations and guilds and societies. They all showed up at her funeral mass and they were sending in memorials. They had this huge crowd for her service that was finally held in November of 2021. And Mm -hmm. you can actually find that on YouTube if you're interested in watching it. You can watch her funeral mass. Okay, so what I find so fun about her and I mean, I love her her legacy of church music, but I, in addition to that, what I find so fun about all of this, and this was an insight that uh, Dr. Nunez was talking about a lot, because he he knew her personally for a little while. He is, I should have mentioned this, he is actually the interim pastor at St. John the Evangelist in Brooklyn right now. <laughs> so so he, he actually knew her personally for a little while. And what's so fun in the midst of all of this beautiful and lyrical music making um that was not her personality and not in a bad way. She d- she wasn't a mild manner person. She kind of adopted the East Coast mannerisms, even though she was a transplant. She was very blunt in her opinions about her, not bashful about sharing her opinions, but always with this like twinkle in her eye, mm-hmm. you know, throwing around the witty snark and stuff. And I think it's so wonderful to have this contrast of her her earthy humor and and blunt opinions, but also this really transcendent music um, that gives you a peek into her beautiful heart and mind. But that blunt opinion is opinionism. <laughs> that also meant that she was willing to speak up for other people as well. She was very active in community advocacy locally, as well as marching in the civil rights movement nationally with Reverend Newhouse. So she had this voice for other people as well. And the little tidbit that I love the most is her love for beautiful things as gifts of our creator, um, which resonates very deeply with me. So not only did she create beautiful music for the church, she also made Christmas cards for people in the form of hymns. And she loved glasswork, so making glass art and making pyramids for church altars. Mm -hmm. So she was this like uber creative person who who loved color and loved creating things and making the church a beautiful place with music and with artwork. I think we may have been besties had I known her because those are all also my favorite things. (laughs) Nice. And at her funeral mass, they actually displayed all of the pyramids that she had made over the years. So you could see on display all of this artwork. In conclusion, wrapping this up. So Dr. Nunez wrote in her obituary that in a religious tradition dominated by men who often overlooked and overshadowed women composers, especially women from non-white or urban settings, Amanda Schoen. Yeah. And you know, he points out the religious tradition. Yes, our, you know, Lutheran church tradition is, you know, the women women often play a quieter role, but also in the musical tradition, because very few composers or directors of symphony orchestras or, you know, the the maestros, the classical music world is very dominated by men. Yep. And so to be a, a significant contributor in that world as she was is that's pretty awesome. Yes, absolutely. And Amanda herself said as part of her biography in the Hymnal Companion, and I think this is on Wikipedia too, she said, I write for the congregational singing, believing that we do sing with one voice, young and old, people of all walks of life, new singers and experienced singers. Together we sing praise to the one who accepts all our praise, no matter how beautiful it is or how humble it may be. And I think that right there just sums up her entire life and legacy of her work. Amanda wanted everyone to be able to sing God's word, and she vigorously shared her love of music and liturgy with those around her. And I think it's going to be pretty wonderful to make a joyful noise with her around the throne of the Lamb in heaven. Mm. So, amen. There you have 
Amanda Husberg Man, and her story. I got a list of people I got to meet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> meet. This keeps getting longer. Yeah, I'm, I think it's really cool that here is somebody who is who's alive in my lifetime. Yeah. They had this kind of legacy. Some of the people that we talk about, a lot of the people that we talk about in the Lutheran Church are people from hundreds of years ago. But the church lives on and, and continues right. to mm-hmm. raise up these people who have, have these gifts to offer that God has given them. And Amanda Husberg, what a cool one to learn about today. Yeah. It, people like her remind us that there's still room for more contribution. Yep. There's still mm-hmm. room for more gifts. Mm-hmm. That not all the hymns have been written. Not yeah. all the songs have been sung. That if there's something that we can create and contribute as a gift to the church, that it's well worth giving. Mm-hmm. And it's happening today. Yeah. I mean, not yes, like maybe not like right here, right now, today. But No, definitely not. I ain't doing that. You used up all your creative mojo. Uh, yeah. I'm just <laughs> ready with theater episode recently. <laughs> then, uh... But you know, hypothetically, today, somewhere, somebody is writing a hymn, writing a hymn tune, and it goes on and on. Maybe one of your yep. kids will be the next Amanda Husberg. Hey, I can hope. That God would... is good. God can do that. <laughs> I was going to say, we we know some of those contemporary Lutheran lady hymn writers that are in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge Facebook group. So nice segue, yeah. Sarah. Yes. Yes. Speaking of which, <laughs> you can join our community on Facebook and share your own stories of Lutheran ladies that you know that have amazing stories. We would love to hear them in our Facebook group, the Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can also share those stories with us on Instagram. Follow us there at Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can find all of our podcasts, including our previous Storytime with Sarah episodes at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge or on your favorite podcasting app or on the KFUO radio app. And if you're not on social or if you are on social and you like reading news about us in your email rather than in your Facebook feed, you can sign up for our new email newsletter list. If you scroll down in the show notes for this episode, you'll find the link to the MailChimp sign-up list. You can do that. You can also email us directly if you have something you want to share with us. You can email lutheranladies at kfuo.org, and that'll go to all four of us. So we'd love to hear from you. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. KFUO Radio and the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast are underwritten in part by Ad Crucem. Visit them online at adcrucem.com. Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Join our community on Facebook in the Lutheran Ladies Lounge. Hang on just a sec. Just kidding. Oh, oh was that for me? Thank you. Just All right. Record. I'll see you later. She brought me a cracker. Yes. Has <laughs> it got peanut butter in the middle? Hang on. Or cheese. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. She found a cheese one. I thought they were all gone. Wow. These ones are the best. I thought they were all gone. The kids went through the giant box that Ken bought and just fished out all the cheese crackers. Because they're they're more peanut butters for me, then. (laughs) Come on over, Brie. We'll have a a feast of peanut butter. 20 hours. (laughs) Oh, we got a donut in after. I got excited when you said, I said, come on over. Um, so that was the last package. It was at the very bottom. It was <laughs> okay. That was sacrificial, though. Like, let's yeah. be honest, it was the very last cheese on cheese. Like, yeah. shared it with their mother. <laughs> yeah, that's adorable. So good. Now I'm ready. <laughs> okay, I already hit record, so <laughs> I got all of that. <laughs> oh, Sarah. <laughs> I hit record right before you said, wait, <laughs> like, well, there's no going back now. Nope. Okay, here Onward. we go.